Thank you. So I got Langdon's book on Audible a couple months ago and listened to the whole thing and loved it. And um, I have a new favorite book today, too, and I picked up Eating Wildly. So I want to tell you about the author. To set the tone of the evening for foraging, I've asked her to read for us for just a couple of minutes. So I want to tell you a little bit about her. Ava Chin is the author of Eating Wildly, Foraging for Life, Love, and the Perfect Meal, which Kirkus Reviews called A Delectable Feast of the Heart. The former urban forager columnist for the New York Times, she has written for the Los Angeles Times Sunday Magazine, Savoir, The Village Voice, and Spin. She holds a PhD from the University of Southern California and an MA from Johns Hopkins University, and she is a professor of creative nonfiction at the City University of New York. Ava, would you treat us to just three minutes from your book? Would you? Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to be able to share Eating Wildly, uh, my memoir with you about how foraging changed my life um, and how it offered me sustenance in a pivotal moment um, in time. Now, years ago, when I started off as a newbie forager and a brand new spanking member of the New York Mycological Society, um, I embarked upon my first morale season. Now, after several weeks of fruitless searching, a friend generously offered to show me one of his sweet spots. And I'm going to read to you from that section of the book. As Jim, my friend, surveyed the land up ahead, I stayed behind, touching the earth, trying to gain a new perspective. I watched him growing smaller and smaller in the distance and waited for my foraging eyes to sharpen. I was on my hands and knees, hovering above the ground, trying to meet the morels on eye level and on their own terms. I willed myself to breathe, just breathe. It was only then that I saw something, about a yard in front of me under the cover of viney bramble, seeming to rise up as if in technicolor. A beautiful, fully mature morel, as large as my hand. Morcella esculenta, the yellow morel. It was magical in its perfection, classically honeycombed and vaguely leaning like the Tower of Pisa. I crawled over and inhaled its earthy aroma the way I used to when rumbling through, rummaging through the giant bins of mushrooms with my grandfather in Chinese supermarkets. The mochella was moist and wet in my hands. Now, something happens when you make your first find. It's like what people say about acid changing your vision that once you take your first hit, you never see the same way again. Once my eye and brain had the morel firmly imprinted on them from the wild, the pattern recognition started to kick in. A few seconds later, I was able to see another short gray one right next to the first, and then another perfectly formed morcella next to that. I was surrounded by the entire cluster of morels. I fell back onto my knees, mushroom drunk and giddy. I called out to Jim, who smiled and laughed at the sight of me. I was surrounded by morels, giant stands of them growing in clumps of three and four, from tiny babies to a number that were size of my fist. I paused a moment to acknowledge the discovery and thanked the underground mycelium, branching out in unseen threads all around me. Thank you. Um, so that was a real treat and an honor for me to share Eating Wildly with you. And after Langdon's um, presentation, he and I will be in the author's area signing books, and we look forward to meeting each and every one of you. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce this evening's keynote, Langdon Cook, whose work investigates the underground subcultures of mushroom hunters and foragers, illuminating the humanity of these men and women and ultimately bringing their stories and struggles to light. Now, Langdon Cook, as many of you know, is the author of The Mushroom Hunters, which was the winner of the 2014 Pacific Northwest Book Award. He's also the author of Fat of the Land, Adventures of a 21st Century Forger. The Seattle Times described his writing as lyrical, practical, and quixotic. 
He's interested in people who live at the intersection of food and nature. His lecture is about the men and women, many of whom are immigrants from war-torn countries, migrant workers, or refugees from the old economy who bring wild mushrooms to market. Can you please welcome my friend and yours, Langdon Cook. Thank you, Ava, for that lovely introduction and uh, lovely reading. I have a copy of Eating Wildly at Home, and I would encourage you all to run out after this and buy it so that you can get the author to sign it for you, uh, which I plan to do afterwards. Uh, so uh, tonight we're going to get on the mushroom trail. Uh, and actually, I should say one more thing before we get to that. I just want to say hats off to Rebecca and Dan and everyone else who has... They breathe so much life into this event, and I just want to say it's a huge honor for me to be here. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, uh, I thought maybe I would show you a little of the good vibe that I'm experiencing here from, from my daughter who texted me this morning. Uh, and she just wanted to wish me, she's nine, Ruby, and she just wanted to wish me good luck tonight, and she sent me this picture that she did this morning. Now, I think that's a house that we would all like to live in. <laughs> you know, what they do when they're not in school, right? So this is actually a picture. Actually, let me get my pointer here, see if this thing works. There we go. There's Ruby. And this picture was taken in Colorado a few years ago, and she's holding up one of Colorado's finest, the Aspen Belit there, a uh, variety of Lexinum. And uh, this is what happened to it. A few hours later, after my son caught a nice brook trout, and uh, we took that porcini and chopped it up and stuffed the trout and baked it and had a wonderful dinner from the wild. So this is uh, all to say this is what I'm about. Um, as you mentioned, the intersection of food and nature. Uh, that's where I like to hang out. Uh, I'm not a mycologist. I'm a writer. Uh, and I write about people who plant their flag at that intersection. Uh, and so tonight, we're going to get on the mushroom trail, which for me began in 2006, uh, when one of my most favorite places in the world went up in flames. Now, I know that sounds pretty bad, uh, but the Pesatan Wilderness here, pictured in this US Forest Service photo, uh, is a place where I've probably done more backpacking than anywhere else in the world. And of course, it was tough to see it go up in flames, but at the same time, I knew that, you know, this is part of, of nature. This is part of the fire ecology of the West. And in fact, the following spring, I was already preparing myself for the bounty and the regeneration of nature that would follow. Excuse me. I might change to the microphone if that works. Is this on? Dean, can you? Oh, we're good. Um, as you can see there, the beautiful Morcella that you wrote about there, Ava, in their brilliant clusters following the fire in the following spring. Uh, and so uh, that was in 2007 following the Tripod Fire, uh, which was in uh, northern Washington, uh, north of Winthrop, Washington, uh, one of my favorite areas. And so I was out there. Uh, and I was having dreams of foods that I was going to get ready to prepare with all these morels. For instance, these diver scallops with morels in a, in a spring green pea sauce. Or our West Coast answer to a Sichuan stir fry with uh, gooey duck clam and morels sauteed up together. So these are some of the things that were going through my mind and, of course, dry, drying all my bounty, and uh, in the depths of winter, being able to make up a nice, say, red wine sauce with dried and reconstituted morels, and, and uh, having a hearty dinner like this one shown here. So back to the tripod fire in 2007. There I am with my friend Chris, as he's pictured here, and, uh, you know, we're walking through, and you heard that 
there can be incredible bounty of morels following a forest fire, but you still have to unlock nature's secrets. You have to get out there in the topography and figure out, you know, the good areas to go to. And it's not always as easy as you've heard. And, uh, and so we're walking around, and, uh, you know, we've got our baskets and, you know, our woven Guatemalan baskets and maybe five pounds of morels in our baskets, and we're traipsing along, you know, and we start hearing these noises in the woods all around us. And, and the thing that was unnerving about these noises was in an area that's known for its grizzly bears and its wolves, the noises we were hearing were human. And we knew that they were communicating with each other, with these yips and hollers that we couldn't fully understand because they were in a different language. And uh, we got a little spooked, a little unnerved. So we backed off into a meadow, heard a twig snap, turned around, and there were these two guys, okay? And, uh, and they were standing there, and they had pack boards on with rectangular crates stacked up the pack board, and I would estimate that each one of them had about 80 pounds of morels on his back, okay? So instinctively, we knew that we were looking at commercial mushroom hunters. Uh, and uh, I'd heard, you know, the stories, and of course, you know, with the stories you hear about, you know, pistol packing, territorial mushroom hunters who guard their patches. And, uh, and so, you know, we just sort of stood there and looked at them, and they looked at us, and not a word was exchanged. And then just like that, they turned on their heels and disappeared back into the timber. And so, you know, we're standing there thinking, how did these guys unlock nature's secrets, you know, to the point where they could walk into trailless woods and, uh, you know, figure out the topography and the tree canopy and the, and the, the, the moisture and, and the, all, the slope aspect and all these different things that go together like a Rubik's Cube of nature so that they could find 80 pounds of morels apiece. And it was at that moment that I realized I needed to get to know some of these people. I was writing my first book, Fat of the Land, at the time, and I was doing research for my morale chapter, but I was looking ahead thinking, I need to get to know some of these guys and just see how they do it. But, you know, I started asking around, and nobody really, you know, knew who they were. It was sort of this invisible economy that was operating in the woods. And, uh, and so I asked around, and eventually a trail led to this guy right here. Now this is Doug Carnell. He's what's known as a circuit picker. Uh, a circuit picker travels with the mushroom flushes. Uh, he's semi-itinerant semi and uh, you know, in the spring he's following the morel flushes up the, the eastern slope of the Sierras and the Cascades and he might go all the way up into British Columbia and then come back down in the fall to hunt chanterelles closer to his home in Westport, Washington and uh, maybe go out to Montana. He's all over the place in the greater northwest hunting mushrooms because you can do that 12 months out of the year in the greater northwest. So uh, I got to know Doug and the first time he took me out. We went to some woods on the Olympic Peninsula. And, uh, and there I am with him, and, you know, we're crashing through the Salal and the Huckleberry and the old cedar slash left over from when this was a howling wilderness and it was all the trees were cut maybe a hundred years ago and then replanted and then cut again and then replanted and cut one more time. And so we're in these cut over woods, walking through pretty dense forest, and uh, he's, he's sort of a, you know, as you can see, he's sort of a tall guy with long limbs. And uh, he's a mushroom picker. He's got to be efficient. So he's moving very fast through the woods. And uh, pretty soon I start to fall behind. And uh, after a little while, I can't, I can't see him. I can't see him through the old, through the huckleberry and the slash. I can't hear him. And it's kind of claustrophobic in the woods. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, you know, maybe this is with all those other sort of manly pursuits like, um, you know, the military or fishing boats and that sort of thing, where he's, he's just sort of, he's taking me out into the woods and he's trying to spin me around to see if I'm man enough to find my way back out. And a paranoid thought crosses my mind that he's sort of left me to figure out my way here. 
but then I heard his voice up over a ridge, and I chastised myself for doubting, and I scrambled up and I found him. And he was just standing there, and he was looking down into a ravine, and, uh, and this is what we saw. That's just one of hundreds and hundreds of hedgehog mushrooms that littered this ravine, really as far as the eye could see. And he just turned to me and he said, you know, it's just a small patch. And so I followed Doug around, and, uh, and he revealed other secrets to me, uh, things that I didn't know. For example, here we're walking what he calls the grades. The grades are left over from the old days of logging when they did the railroad logging. And uh, they built railroad tracks into the woods, and they, they harvested the timber. And after a while, they pulled the tracks. But you still had these grades left. And, uh, and very poor soil there. And they just grow mushrooms like a crop. And you, know, you really have to know your way around the Olympic Peninsula to know where these grades are. And basically, he found them from a lifetime of hunting elk. And so he took me out to the grades. And we picked all kinds of stuff. We picked hedgehogs, such as these pictured here, matsutake, porcini, just loading up our baskets. And this is Doug's picking partner. This is Jeff, looking kind of sinister here, but actually uh, is a very sweet guy, holding some coastal kings there in his hand. And, uh, and these guys would go out together as picking partners. And they very much represent, I would come to learn, sort of the first wave of mushroom pickers in this country. Because it really didn't get going in any commercial mushroom pickers I'm referring to. It didn't really get going in any sort of meaningful way until the late 70s, early 80s, uh, with guys who were kind of refugees from the old economy. So Doug, for instance, had been a logger. He'd captained a crab boat. Uh, he'd been a commercial fisherman. He'd done all sorts of things in the woods. He, he lived in rural areas. He knew his way around the woods. He knew where the mushroom patches were. He needed the money. Uh, so he was part of that first wave of mushroom pickers. And so together, these guys would travel around uh, and harvest mushrooms. So here's Jeff holding a five-pound cauliflower mushroom. He probably got... I don't know, maybe $5 a pound for that mushroom when he sold it to the buyer. So that was a $25 mushroom for him. The buyer probably turned around and sold it to a restaurant for, say, $10 a pound, a $50 mushroom. So you can see the scale there. And in that transaction, there is built-in tension, which is, as a writer, is the sort of tension that I'm looking for when I'm following characters like this and trying to create a narrative. And I realized that just in the economic transaction was the story. And so I needed to get to know people on the other side. And that led me to this guy. This is the buyer, Jeremy Faber. OK, so right, right here, he's uh, grading porcini mushrooms. And, uh, and Jeremy, he, uh, he's originally from the East Coast. He's a New Yorker uh, by temperament as well. And uh, he studied forestry and went to culinary school, came out to Seattle, worked as a chef all around at different restaurants, became kind of the house forager, and, uh, and then realized that he actually wanted to spend more time in the woods than in the restaurants. So here he is. He's just harvested. Uh, you can see the remains of cauliflower mushrooms left over. He's probably harvested about 20 pounds of cauliflower there from woods on the Olympic Peninsula. And, uh, and here he is. This is what he might be doing right now as the lobster mushrooms are taking off in Washington. That's a nice big one right there. And of course, for people like me, we get these sort of things home. And there are all kinds of wonderful concoctions that we can make out of them, such as this West Coast meets East Coast double cross-country lobster risotto with Maine lobster and Washington lobster mushroom. So back to Jeremy and the buying end of things. So Jeremy, uh, you know, he loves being in the woods, but he has to travel 
foreign ride because as his business grows, he needs many, many more mushrooms than he can possibly find himself. So, for instance, right now, he's in Raymond, Washington in this picture, and he's gone out there, and he'll do this maybe two or three times a, a week in the fall to buy mushrooms. And as soon as he shows up in Raymond, the word goes out by cell phone, text, email, uh, what have you. And within five minutes, and I would see this again and again, there are 30 guys standing at the back door with baskets overflowing with lobsters and porcini and chanterelles, all there to sell their mushrooms to Jeremy. For instance, this guy with a nice basket of porcini that he picked along the beach of Washington. And here's Jeremy grading the, uh, the number one porcini buttons. So with porcini uh, and some other species, they need to be graded. He will cut every single one of these mushrooms in half because some of them might have worms in them. And if they have worms in them, they get shunted aside. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he might not be buying them at all. Or maybe he'll be buying them but as dryers. And then the picker gets a fraction of the price in that case. So he chops them all in half to look for worm infestations. And here you can see a nice basket of number one porcini buttons being weighed out. And I love this picture because although uh, most of the mushroom pickers I would meet uh, in several seasons of being on the mushroom trail with them, most of the mushroom pickers were men, although there were quite a few female pickers as well. But often, uh, in, for instance, a place like Raymond, the men would show up with their baskets, but their wives would come too, uh, because they were the ones with the checkbook. They were the ones keeping tabs on, you know, the money at home. And so here you can see the look of consternation as they watch the grading process very closely to see their profits ebbing and flowing as the mushrooms get graded. Because, you know, a basket might look perfect, but once Jeremy starts slicing them in half and they get shunted aside, they can see their profits going down the drain. So here they are looking very carefully. And I should also mention that, as you can see, a lot of these pickers are Southeast Asian. And so they recommend, if, if Doug and Jeff are sort of part of that first wave of mushroom pickers that got going in the downturn of the logging industry in the late 70s, early 80s, um, these folks really represent that second wave. Uh, and while, while Doug and Jeff might be sort of, you know, these refugees from the old economy, these folks are true refugees from war-torn countries. Uh, and the stories that I would hear were just harrowing about their escapes, um, how they made their way over the course of several years to this country, uh, and just really harrowing and amazing tales. Uh, and, you know, we can get into some of that later. I met, I met a woman, for instance, um, she was a little girl, and um, the Khmer Rouge came, knocked on the door. She was hiding with her mother in the bushes outside the house. Her brother was inside. They tied him up and uh, tied him to a chair. They interrogated him. Where's your family? He didn't say anything. They shot him. If I, if I were to see that and I was interested in buying some, I'd ask the guy to cut it in half so I can see. Uh, because you never know. You cut it in half and it could be riddled. Yes? So... So picking clean is a big issue. And in fact, I have a section in the book about Doug getting in trouble with Jeremy because he wasn't picking clean enough. Um, so the pickers who pick clean are really appreciated by the buyers. And they will sometimes, if they have a good relationship with the buyer, maybe even get a little extra uh, per pound for picking clean because that just saves everybody up the line time and money. So picking clean is definitely a big issue. in the truffle world, for sure. Uh, and I did spend time with truffle hunters. I have a whole chapter about truffles uh, that takes place at the Oregon Truffle F Festival. Um, so, you know, they're really encouraging the use of dogs uh, there. Uh, and I think that's a great thing because, you know, dogs have smellers that are something like 10,000 times stronger than ours. 
And one of the big issues with the truffles is that they, that they get raked up when they're either immature and don't have any scent or when they're overripe. And at that point, they're kind of, you know, gross and decomposing. And yet, you know, truffles, the whole sort of truffle culture in this country is so young that you could go to the market. For instance, a friend of mine brought home some truffles from Whole Foods and showed them to me because she thought something was amiss. And I took a look at the package. First of all, they were packaged in plastic, and I could press my finger right through the truffle. That's how rotten it was. And we, we unwrapped it, and it just smelled awful. And so I just told her, look, you've got to take that back to the manager at Whole Foods and explain why they can't sell truffles like this. Because too often what happens is truffles that are either unripe or overripe are being sold to consumers who then shrug and go, what's the big deal? You know, we've heard all about this from Europeans, but this doesn't seem really special. And so, you know, up the line, it becomes a problem. So there's just an education process that needs to happen with our own truffle culture here. And of course, we do have native truffles. Uh, we have uh, black truffles and white truffles uh, up and down the Pacific uh, coast that grow with Douglas firs. Um, you know, Jeremy Faber, would, he sells truffles, although he would tell you that he really doesn't think they're all that special, the native truffles here. He would much prefer to sell European truffles, um, but that's just him. You know, there are a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about our native uh, North American truffles, and I think we're going to be seeing more from that, um, you know, end of it. Okay. Yeah, let's take two more questions. To prepare what? Amanita muscaria. Uh, I've only eaten it once, um, and I ate it on one of David Aurora's forays. Uh, he's sort of infamous for serving it. Uh, we did boil it in two changes of water in a very large vat, I should add. Um, and I have to say, I thought it was, um, it was pretty tasty. It's a lot to go through to detoxify it. Uh, and it's controversial. A lot of, there are a lot of people out there who would prefer that, you know, you not be told how you could detoxify it because they think it's too dangerous. Um, I'm kind of in the middle on that. Um, you know, if you want to give it a shot, uh, go for it. But be aware of the possibilities for not doing it quite right and, uh, and getting more than you bargained for. Yes, last question. Yeah, so the, the main truffle that's being cultivated is the Perigord black truffle. Uh, and I know some of the folks who are involved in this, like Charlie Lefevre in Oregon, uh, and they're inoculating trees, uh, different varieties of oaks uh, and other trees. And so far, you know, this is very young, um, early stages at this point. Um, and I've heard that there are a few people out there with truffle orchards who are starting to get some truffles. Uh, it's taken like, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, so we might be hearing more from that front. Uh, at the same time, I've gone to the Oregon Truffle Festival several times, and it seems like more and more people are enthusiastic about trying this. So I think you're going to see more truffle orchards uh, coming online in the next few years. And it just remains to be seen how well they do, because it does take several years before you get a truffle. So we're, we're in the infancy right now. So thank you all. Uh, have a great rest of the festival. Langdon, you really honor us with your presence and such phenomenal research and your lecture. Thank you.